Last but not least, David Simon is going to talk about the Rwandan Tutsi genocide, and is also uh, with with uh, Rwanda also questions of terminology and the use of, of uh, Tutsi. Absolutely, uh, and thank you very much, Armin. Thank you all again for for being here. And I know we're at the end of the session. Um, uh, I'm going to try to be quick. Uh, let me ask the same, the, the, the question, how many of you all teach Rwanda in your classes to some extent? I suspect, okay, so we'll, we'll got the numerical advantage here over um, Armenia and Bosnia. Um, yeah, it, I found from, uh, from teaching a class at the college level that students often come in with, um, with exposure to Rwanda, often in a, a, a 12th grade or 11th grade uh, uh, world history class of some sort, sometimes a sort of special topic uh, elective. Um, so I think it, it is a little bit more part of the, the vocabulary of, uh, of current events or recent events of, of 20th century history. Um, and maybe for that reason, and also because it's like 12.10 right now, uh, I'm going to go very quickly. I'm not going to talk about what happened so much as uh, to sort of say, hey, the, the question that we want to, that I think that the key questions that we can ask about Rwanda are really about uh, why. Why did this happen? And as you'll see, uh, I think we can kind of break that out into sort of three different categories, three different lines of inquiry, none of which we should, should, we should find satisfactory on their own, uh, but all of which we can sort of pull them together I think you can start to get a very rich understanding of a, a global event which is both horrific and compli complicated or complex. So I'm going to just try to sketch the outlines of that. Uh, I'll, I'll try to keep this as short as I can, um, and, uh, and we'll see, uh, we'll, see uh, we'll maybe have time for questions afterwards, and, and I'll be available for a short amount of time in a kind of breakout session. So. Uh, the basic story, as I said, I'm not going to dwell on it. Um, there's controversies, controversies about the death toll, but it's, it's usually somewhere in the high six figures there. Uh, the, uh, the killers were mostly, mostly of the Hutu ethnic group in Rwanda. The victims uh, were uh, of the genocide were by definition uh, of the Tutsi ethnic group. The, the government in Rwanda, now post-genocide, um, is uh, uh, predominantly Tutsi, and uh, they, when they were at, at the in the UN Security Council, the presidency of the UN Security Council, they passed a resolution that said that the official terminology, in at least in all UN reference to the Rwandan genocide, is that it should be called the genocide against the Tutsi uh, in Rwanda. That said, there were tens of thousands of Hutu victims at the hands of Hutu perpetrators. And there were also Hutu victims at the hands of Tutsi perpetrators. It's uh, a smaller amount, probably still in the tens of thousands. It's that latter category that has the government of Rwanda uh, very, worry, very wary that, uh, uh, that some people might conclude, well, Hutus killed Tutsis, Tutsis killed Hutus. It was a double genocide. Uh, in fact, when we look at genocide, when we think about genocide as defined by the UN or as we think about it even notionally, this effort to destroy a group, to murder, uh, murder a group out of existence, we see that very much in what Hutus, uh, a Hutu elite was trying to do via mobilization of, of Hutu masses um, uh, with respect to the Tutsi. And the other two versions in which they're Hutu victims don't quite involve that dynamic, although they do involve massacres and mass killing uh, uh, as well. Um, I'll just leave all of this up there but uh, without comment, but refer to my little box of resources there. Human Rights Watch in 1999 produced a volume uh, published a volume called Leave None to Tell the Story. It's entirely av available online. It's also 795 pages in hard copy. So for a couple, of, unless you, you know, need to weigh, weigh your papers down on your desk, um, I highly recommend the uh, online, online version. Uh, it has 
uh, excellent historical overview sections, excellent context, and it also has um, harrowing descriptions of what went on at a local level, uh, 50 to 100 pages at different local levels talking about what individual actors did. Uh, it, it doesn't describe all, say, 800,000 deaths um, as they were committed, but it is a cross-section in several different communities that gives you an, a, a very good sense of that. Uh, U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum and also Shoah Foundation has testimonies. Uh, the, the BBC Newsweek, uh, the website, and Genocide all have, I think, decent synopses uh, and, and article length digestible uh, forms there. Uh, certainly Facing History has, a, has an excellent uh, set of lesson plans uh, for Rwanda. I, I wanted to mention film controversies uh, because uh, a lot of, uh, used to be at least, uh, schools would assign or would show Hotel Rwanda I don't know, does anyone, do people do that here? Yeah. yeah. And that's, um, that's both, I, I, there's a strong argument for that, and that Hotel Rwanda was written to be essentially an instructional tool. It's almost as if every scene has a footnote, and I could kind of locate where those footnotes are, or what those footnotes are to, in Rwandan literature. Somewhat unfortunately, the key component, the star, Paul Rusesabagina, the, the hotelier, who's sort of the star of the show, turns out to be something of a, and this is, this is uh, my view, the government of Rwanda is a much stronger view, but I would say a kind of self-serving promoter and um, uh, who has political ambitions in Rwanda. Uh, he, the government of Rwanda claims that mostly what he did was charge Tutsis uh, for the right to be protected for a short while. The, I think that they, the government of Rwanda overlooks the sort of heroic actions that he did to protect those who had paid for that service. Uh, but it's a little bit more complicated story than the, sort of the, the grand story of Hotel Rwanda portrays. Uh, that said, you know, it, it gets a lot of it, it, does a very good job of getting it. Who were the perpetrators? Why were they, how were they mobilized? What was the role of hate speech? Um, were there, what was the impact on families? What was the construction of ethnicity? Some of the issues that I will touch upon briefly in a, uh, in a moment. There are several other films as well. Um, one of my favorites, I think, as an instructional piece uh, is the film, um, uh, it's, it's called Shooting Dogs in, it's called Beyond the Gates in, uh, in the US. It's called Shooting Dogs in the UK. Uh, it, it, it suffers from having uh, what, what Africanists call, people, uh, students of African politics and Af uh, call white protagonist syndrome, WPS, <laughs> which is to say that it's centered around a young um, aid worker slash, slash missionary, um, but it doesn't hold back. On, and so it's sympathetic to his plight, but ultimately it's his sort of moral failings and, and weaknesses that come in, in the face of his inability to stand up and he comes to, to represent the international community's failure uh, to, to protect uh, and to intervene and to prevent genocide. So if you look past the fact that the, the producer saw fit to make him the true protagonist, he's kind of an anti-protagonist in that he's no hero uh, and that the story, um, it is slightly layered, but really, I think, unflinchingly tell uh, and, and strongly uh, shows, uh, shows that weakness. Uh, if you're looking for a, uh, an all African cast, for example, the film um, 100 Days is excellent, but maybe I would screen it first before showing it to your, preview it first before showing it to your kids. It's, it's pretty powerful, it has some pretty gut-wrenching uh, scenes. We talked about tears in the classroom. I did a film, a, 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 an outside of the class uh, film assignment, uh, in which I showed, uh, showed a, a series of films throughout the, the years, and every, throughout the, the term, and every time when we flipped the lights back on, there would be uh, you know, sniffles and uh, passing the tissues around, uh, appropriately so. They're, they're difficult films uh, to watch. Sometimes in April, which came out the same time as Hotel Rwanda, it's an HBO production. I think it's also, 
uh, essentially footnoted the same way. And uh, although it's a little, makes a little less of an effort to say this is a, a film for high school students, um, it's, it's pretty, pretty powerful and I think pretty well done. Um, okay, the, um, the explanations for Rwanda, I will uh, touch upon these. I'm not gonna go into everything that I have listed up here. But let me say that there are two major Rwanda-based explanations. One is ethnicity. And this is in the early 90s, early in the Clinton administration, with uh, uh, the breakup of Yugoslavia was happening with the, the wars, the ethnic cleansing, and the genocide eventually uh, happening there. Uh, there was an influential book by Robert Kaplan called Balkan Ghosts, which basically made the claim, I think the, the, the phrase comes from his book, that in, in Yugoslavia, what you, what you saw was, the, was ancient hatreds kind of coming home to roost. Mixed metaphor, I know. But, uh, but the, in Rwanda, it was very, the, some of the initial reaction is, as Rwanda sort of burst into flames, as it were, was that oh, it's ancient Hutus and Tutsis don't know who they are, but they, they're different ethnic groups in the same country. They must have always hated each other. And again, ancient hatreds are, are the problem. Now, it's obviously, that's a way too simplistic view, although there were political differences and divisions throughout history uh, exacerbated in colonialism, but perhaps predating colonialism as well, and further exacerbated after uh, colonialism. I, I think it's really interesting to delve into the construction of those uh, ethnicities over time by different sources in you know, pre-colonial, colonial, and post-colonial uh, eras uh, to sort of see, you know, why is it that people who call themselves Hutu and people who call themselves Tutsi, why were they at odds in this respect? Ultimately, you see a lot of the politics, and you also see just you know, this notion of, of uh, social or political construction of, in this case, ethnicity, um, but it may even open up the door to a discussion of the ways in which race is constructed differently in different parts of the world. Um, so I, I, I found that you know, perhaps explosive in a way, but a really interesting and I think an important conversation to have in the classroom. Um, as I said in my first presentation, I see genocide as generally as a process, a crime that results from a process. Um, and there are a lot of politics behind that. You could look at that moment of time, the 80s and 90s in um, you know, in Africa generally, in the, in, uh, the, the so-called third world generally, you see these patterns of economic crisis, uh, push to democratize, uh, civil war uh, that, that, that emerged, a, a post-Cold War peace process, a post-Cold War peace agreement, uh, and, and sort of see these pressures that are on a sort of fragile post-colonial state. Uh, if you look into all of those, it's, it's not inevitable that genocide should happen, but it becomes another lens and a, a way to a, another way to appreciate that genocide in Rwanda was a politically created event. It didn't happen because of anthropology. It, it, it happened because of, of politics and the, the exploitation of kind of man-made ethnic differences, man um, or man-shaped, if not made, uh, ethnic differences. Uh, the, the genocide began on April, officially April 7th, 1994. On April 6th of 1994, uh, a plane crash carrying the president of Rwanda and the president of Burundi back from a, it wasn't quite a peace negotiation, it was a peace treaty implementation uh, uh, conference in Tanzania. The plane approached the runway in, in Kigali in Rwanda, was shot out of the sky by unknown attackers. It's a decent argument that it was Hutu or Tutsi. Um, I tend to think it was Hutu. Uh, but at any rate, uh, with the president dead overnight, it, at eight, in, this happened about eight in the evening, um, by the next morning, the presidential guard had fanned out across uh, Kigali. Uh, they were going door to door looking for um, opponents of the president, be they Hutu or Tutsi, so a political, sort of the opposition political elite, and then very soon after that, all Tutsis throughout the, the country became uh, targeted. Um, but the third strand of, 
of understanding the genocide in Rwanda. The third strand of asking this question, why did it happen? And um, I actually, yeah, yeah. L let me back up when I realize that in this, in this second strand, there's one of this, the ethnicity. This is the top politics. What's useful, interesting, fascinating, and chilling is to try to connect that to the, uh, the bottom politics. Why is it that there were, another important question to ask, a key question is, a compelling question, is why did people participate in this, in this genocide? You see uh, you know, the, the grand politics. How did that lead people to pick up a machete and, uh, and, and raise it against their neighbor or, um, or go to the next uh, community over and start killing? It's a very difficult question. I'm happy to talk a little bit about it more. Um, I should probably reference the books by Jean Hatzfeld, uh, including most importantly, Machete Season, um, in which he's interviewed a bunch of, uh, a handful of convicted killers who are sitting in jail, um, and they talk about the reasons uh, why they did. And again, I think it's a very important, very chilling uh, discussion. One of the things that comes out of it is that the killers basically cite a version of peer pressure. Everyone was doing it. I would lose my status in the village, in the community, if I didn't. Once I started doing it and saw that I was good at it, I realized this was a way to gain status, and so I kept on doing it. And if it sounds a little bit like high school, um, yeah, it, it, it actually kind of, it, there is this echo um, in a more kind of extreme and darker version of what's going on. But let me, let me jump over to the international side, because I think this is another very accessible way to talk, an important way to talk about Rwanda. Uh, the, a third strand of why it happened was that it was allowed to happen. We had the information there, um, but we didn't act. Um, in fact, it's, I always uh, bristle a little bit when people say the US and the world didn't do anything when they found out about Rwanda. They did do something. It was to step away. They were already there. There were 2,500 peacekeepers in Kigali that, that had to make several conscious decisions not to help Tutsis in Rwanda. One of them was to reallocate those peacekeepers from protecting civilians to evacuating expats. And this was actually the, the crux of that movie, uh, um, Beyond the Gates. It, the, the, the civilians at this, this, uh, this school where Tutsi said, uh, the, or sorry, the, the, the um, peacekeepers who were at the school where Tutsi civilians had gathered were called away to protect the, uh, to help you know, various aid workers and diplomatic officials from different countries help them get to the airport so that they could leave. And as soon as those peacekeepers left the school, the Hutu militia moved in and started, uh, actually they, they rounded everyone up, marched them to a different place and, uh, and killed them all. It's obviously based on a very specific uh, event. Um, so, and that, that was act number one, act of stepping away number one. Act of stepping away number two was a vote at the UN Security Council on April 21st, 1994, two weeks after the crash of the plane, uh, in which the US led the uh, Security Council in voting for removing almost all of those 2,500 troops, evacuating them, making the decision we see, based on the knowledge that there was violence against civilians going on, the peacekeepers who were supposed to be protecting people were told to go home, get out of there. And it was only the intransience of the, uh, the commander of those forces who, who said, hey, anybody want to stay? I'm, I'm staying. That allowed this is the, uh, Lieutenant Ger General uh, Romeo Dallaire who convinced a bunch of peacekeepers, mostly African contingents, Ghanaian, Senegalese, to stick around and do what they could. They were charged only with protecting UN material, um, but they managed to protect and save uh, tens of thousands of people. If the full 2,500 had stayed, or if they'd been reinforced, as Dallaire was asking for, they probably could have saved 
hundreds of thousands and not, uh, not tens of thousands. Um, at, any, at any rate, um, so the world acted. It wasn't just that the, 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 uh, the world didn't act. They did act. They just they, they pulled out. We can ask, you know, the U.S. really was at a, in the lead in this. Uh, why did they do uh, what they did? Um, you know, part of it was that the, the peacekeeping force was formed October 5th, 1993, two days after the infamous Black Hawk Down in, incident, the Battle for Mogadishu. So the, the, in the U.S. Was, had our, from the get-go had connected Rwanda with Somalia. Somalia was a, not only a military disaster in that one operation at least, but more broadly a political disaster. And, and uh, um, Clinton wanted to make sure that American civilians were not killed in the service of some nation building as, as uh, it was sort of known as in the 90s, even if it wasn't really a matter of nation building. Uh, but because of that fear of, of a loss of uh, US service, uh, service people, the US led the charge to uh, do as little as possible and to actively remove, uh, uh, remove forces there. But along the way, they also decided against taking other steps they could have taken, like for, for example, jamming the radio. The radio is known to be broadcasting hateful propaganda, uh, engaging in dehumanizing rhetoric, actually going so far as to say, hey, call in the station if you've seen you know, Joe Smith, because Joe Smith is an enemy of the people and we, we want to kill him. Um, obviously not literally, not word for word, but but uh, the U.S. had the technology to jam radio broadcasts, which would have partially, not entirely, but partially interrupted the, uh, the killing process. And they opted not to do so. On essentially, part of it was uh, com uh, concerns about security. Part of it was concerns about cost, which when you extrapolate it out were sort of laughable. It would have cost a million dollars a day um, for 30 days, 40 days, they, the relief effort afterwards was half a, half a billion dollars at the first, uh, first drop. Um, but also because they said, well, won't this go against the support for free speech and freedom of the press that we're trying to uh, inculcate around the world? And uh, you know, it was multiple justifications. Who knows exactly which one uh, carried the day? Um, a couple of... Uh, of uh, excellent or a few excellent resources on this question. Uh, the National Security Archive, which is a nonprofit organization, a private organization that sounds very official, I think that's part of their strategy, um, has a, a page featuring cables and memos from the time, including the one in which Susan Rice, uh, who would later become the ambassador to the UN under Obama, says, um, uh, if we call it genocide, won't there be pressure to do something. And it's unclear from the two-dimensional paper if she was being ironic uh, or not. Um, but it sort of lays bare the type of thinking, the politics of intervention or the politics of non-intervention that goes on. Samantha Power has been mentioned a couple of time or times already. Her excellent book, uh, um, A Problem from Hell, uh, was excerpted, I guess pre-excerpted, it was teased with a, an article in The Atlantic uh, in 2001 called Bystanders to Genocide that focused on the U.S. role with respect to uh, Rwanda and a couple of PBS films, uh, The Triumph of Evil, which came out in, 80, in 98 or 99, very hard to find, um, but it's an hour long and excellent, and then Ghosts of Rwanda, which is um, of which expert excerpts are available on the web on the PBS Frontline page. It's also excellent, to have, the whole thing happens to be two hours long, uh, a little bit harder to fit in, our, in, in, in my standard lesson, uh, lesson times and probably uh, yours as well. So uh, the last thing we can talk about, because as I mentioned before, when we talk about genocide, one of the things to look at is, uh, one of the reasons we do it is this sort of commemoration uh, rationale. Um, there are legacies of Rwanda that include matters of commemoration, uh, include the regret of officials like uh, Clinton, uh, linked to his apology, um, which is somewhat uh, 
somewhat poignant. Uh, it's interesting to hear what he said afterwards. Kofi Annan was in charge of UN peacekeeping during the Rwanda genocide. He, of course, went on to become Secretary General of the UN. Uh, transitional justice in Rwanda is fascinating. The International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda, for Rwanda was charged with a UN created uh, court charged with prosecuting the masterminds of the genocide, eventually prosecuted about 90 individuals. Gachacha was, which means a, uh, which, uh, essentially a meeting on the grass, was a revival of a uh, pre-colonial local Rwandan custom whereby the town, the, the community elders would decide uh, would adjudicate sort of cattle stealing, actually not cattle stealing, that was too serious, but um, uh, marital disputes, property disputes, and things like that. It was recreated, refashioned uh, to try at a community level uh, genocide suspects and try to figure out at the community, le community level, in every community, what happened and who was responsible for it. And of course, it became also a way in which old scores could be brought up again, perhaps settled, and, and perhaps not. Uh, but uh, it, it's, that's the picture of Kachacha underway uh, there. The gentlemen in pink are arrested prisoners who were uh, taking in their, their pink prison uniforms brought to the court. And you see some of the people from the community who are hearing testimony. I think that particular picture is probably taking place as things are just uh, getting going. Finally, uh, an important legacy of Rwanda goes back to this notion of prevention, the policy rationale, um, which is to say that it really took the Rwandan genocide to get the world to think about, um, well, what, what, what did we really mean by this, those two words, never again? And is there a way in which we can, um, we can mean it this time? Because apparently if Rwanda happened, we didn't really mean it when we said never again before. Uh, and so the UN created an Office of Genocide Prevention, which has a, good, a decent website and interesting links to um, UN statements, uh, but also um, you can sort of trace some of the history of the way in which the UN has dealt with different episodes in the past 20 years, 25 years, well, 20 years. Um, and then I think most importantly, we have the responsibility to protect doctrine, which has come out of all of this as a you know, through the UN, uh, various organs, uh, it's, it doesn't have any official status except recognition by the UN General Assembly. Uh, but it's a doctrine that says, you know, the basis of our sovereign system, is a system of sovereign states, is that uh, people have a, their states have a responsibility to protect their people, not just their citizens, but all their people. And when that, and the international community has a responsibility to help states protect their people. But in those instances where states fail to protect their people, the international community has a responsibility to protect those people, often from their states, or in some cases when the states are unable uh, to do so. And it's kind of a radical change of, you know, if we've been living under some version of the Westphalian system since 1648, in which sovereignty is sacrosanct. And, um, this is an effort to, to recognize at some official level, some doctrinal level, that sovereignty falls short in its ability to protect citizens from their own state. And that therefore, there ought to be some legal doctrine, some way to step over the bounds of sovereignty when genocide um, and crimes against humanity uh, are, are at stake. OK, I think that is all I have planned. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to take questions. So, yes, please. Um, <clears throat> if we look at the Rwandan genocide, as something that has been under, as we look at the Rwandan genocide, as something that has simmered under the surface for perhaps as long as 100 years. and. Then when it finally erupted, we look at Paul Kagame as someone of a savior. And this narrative that, you know, he came in, he saved Rwanda, and today we have this economic miracle. When there's really no discussion of the moral hazards that were taking place, 
uh, during, during his tenure, and what is taking place today in terms of silencing any narrative that doesn't go along with what the government uh, proposes. So I think it might be important that we talk about this, that those elements that created the genocide in the first place are being perpetrated. So in our classroom, we may want to give some kind of notice to that. Yeah, no, I, th I, I think that's important to say, when we look at the legacy of Rwanda, I left off sort of what's actually happening in Rwanda beyond these Machacha the courts. Um, you know, part of what's happening is a, is a state that's in power that has tried to redefine ethnicity. First of all, it says ethnicity doesn't exist. There are no Hutus or Tutsis. But it is also a state that, that brooks no opposition. Opposition parties are illegal, but they have to first agree on the ruling party's platform. And uh, every election that's taken place, any time there has been a challenger uh, who happens to be Hutu, the, or you know, recognized as Hutu retrospectively, not officially if there's no ethnicity, every meaningful challenger has been sort of chased out of the country or thrown in jail um, on the grounds of uh, that they were uh, perpetuating genocide ideology is the official sort of phrase that they use there, uh, which is, um, which in some, you know, which can be a trumped up claim. It could also be, you know, there are connection, there are elements of truth to those, but it's also uh, squeezed out any room for real, real political debate uh, and opposition. You know, there are winners and losers to redefining eth ethnicity the way it's been, or, or to doing away with eth ethnicity, and the losers aren't allowed to have their voice. Uh, you know, finally, it comes to the discussion of denial, which we've been talking about. You know, denial is a horrible thing, and it's part of genocide. The politics of denial can be, the politics of anti-denial can be used as a, as a, a hammer and as a cudgel. Um, and that can be a difficult thing uh, as well. So there's important discussion, a difficult one to find resources on. Uh, but increasingly, I would actually say most mainstream uh, scholars of Rwanda are very critical of the government today. So uh, you can, I, can recommend some resources if you're looking for those as well. That's a footnote. Uh, the International Association of Genocide Scholars was going to meet in, in Kigali, but they then uh, moved their meeting to uh, Virginia because of this issue of, of, uh, of a uniform story and uh, certain scholars not being allowed in the country uh, to uh, present alternative views. Other questions? Okay. Oh well, oh, another, one more footnote. Uh, Hotel Rwanda. That was that was the director was Kerry George, who actually was the director of that Armenian film, The Promise, and he was uh, he uh, he had his credentials from that film, so he was hired to do. To the problems. So, any general comments? Uh, everybody has had a long morning and into the afternoon. Is is anyone? Sorry. Yes. Uh, sure. First of all, thank you. Uh, I think today's presentation is by everybody. Very informative and very, very excellently presented. Thank you. Um, you mentioned at the beginning that there were opportunities for speakers on different genocides and there was maybe funding for that or Avenues. Well, we, we have a uh, like a speakers bureau in Sertan Southern that you, through which you could request Armin or I to, okay. to come to your school. I, I, I'm sure David, you know, would be also uh, make make himself available when, when he's when he's free to do the same. Okay, that, would, that would be excellent. Also, survivors too. I, I, Yes, so Voices of Hope um, at the Hero Center would be able to provide uh, or be able to organize speaker presentations, survivor presentations, either on our field trip programs or to try and organize that in the school itself. Do you have a field trip I also have a presentation on a variant drive that I've given you know, in, in synagogues and also 
at a fifth grade uh, back in school, you know, middle school in New Haven, but they're fifth graders. So I had to be really in my A game. <laughs> and uh, I thought that, so I'd be ha happy to bring that to your, your school. Awesome. Any uh, last, last words? Uh, a, a question, will anyone want, I know that uh, we talked about having a, a, a breakout, do you think, in 